In thee, O Lord, from eternity and thence in thy divine human is all of heaven, all of the church, the divine good, the divine true, and the divine power. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Be gracious unto us, O God, according to thy mercy, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. O Lord, we pray that we may come to thee and worship thee alone that we may become thy sons and may be called the sons of God. Our Father, who art, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. O Lord, lead us to forgive men their trespasses, that thou mayest also forgive us. Glory and might be unto him forever and ever. Amen. Who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Amen. Please join me in reading our selection, Psalm number one. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. The wicked shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the just. For the Lord knows the way of the just, but the way of the wicked shall perish. Amen. Please have a seat. Now, reading from the word of the Lord as it is written in the book of Isaiah, chapter 28, verses 7 through 12, 16, 23 through 26, and 29. But they also have erred through wine and through intoxicating drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through intoxicating drink. They are swallowed up by wine. They are out of the way through intoxicating drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. For all tables are full of vomit and filth. No place is clean. Whom will he teach knowledge? And whom will he make to understand the message? Those just weaned from milk? Those just drawn from the breasts? For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Here a little, there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue, he will speak to this people, to whom he said, this is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, 
a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily. Give ear and hear my voice. Listen and hear my speech. Does the plowman keep plowing all day to sow? Does he keep turning his soil and breaking the clods? When he has leveled its surface, does he not sow the black cumin and scatter the cumin? Plant the wheat in rows, the barley in the appointed place and the spelt in its place. For he instructs him in right judgment, his God teaches him. This also comes from the Lord of hosts, who is wonderful in counsel and excellent in guidance. Amen. And now reading further from the word of the Lord, as it is written in the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus's mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine ran out, Jesus's mother said to him, they have no more wine. Of what concern is this to me and to you, woman? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now six stone water jars had been set there for the Jewish rites of purification. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Now draw some out, he said, and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not know where it was from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone serves the fine wine first and then the cheap wine after the guests are drunk. But you have saved the fine wine until now. Jesus performed this, the first of his signs at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Amen. And now further reading from the word of the Lord, as it is written in Apocalypse Revealed 316. New wine is the divine truth of the New Testament, thus of the new church. And old wine is the divine truth of the Old Testament, thus of the old church. Similar is the signification of those words of the Lord at the marriage in Cana of Galilee. Every man at first sets forth good wine, and when men have had enough, the inferior. But you have kept the good wine until now. The like is also signified by wine in the Lord's parable of the man that was wounded by robbers. The Samaritan poured oil and wine into his wounds. And now finally reading from the word of the Lord, as it is written in Arcana Celestia, 1,937, subsection 6. 
Whatever a person does from love appears to them as freedom, but within that freedom, when the person practices self-compulsion, setting themselves against evil and falsity and doing what is good, heavenly love is present, which the Lord instills at that time and by means of which he creates that person's proprium. It is the Lord's will, therefore, that this proprium should appear to be the person, uh, should appear to the person to be their own, though in fact it is not. This proprium, which a person receives in this manner during their lifetime, by means, as it seems, of compulsion, the Lord replenishes in the next life with limitless forms of delight and happiness. Such people are also by degrees enlightened, or rather are confirmed in the truth that their self-compulsion has not commenced at all in themselves, but that even the smallest of all the impulses of their will has been received from the Lord. They are also led to see that the reason why their compulsion had appeared to commence in themselves was that the Lord might give them a new will as their own. And in this way, the life belonging to heavenly love might be imparted to them as their own. Indeed, the Lord's will is to share with everyone that which is his, thus that which is heavenly so that it may appear to be that person's and to be within him, though in fact it is not theirs. A proprium such as this exists with angels, and insofar as they accept the truth that everything good and true comes from the Lord, the delight and happiness belonging to such a proprium exists with them. Amen. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Amen. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. In the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please have a seat. We are continuing today with our sermon series on the Gospel of John, and we've finally made it to chapter two. <laughs> and uh, the first part of chapter two is the Lord turns, bless you, uh, the water into wine. A very famous story, a very famous miracle, the first miracle. Right at the heart of this miracle in the spiritual sense is the concept of a trine, something that the Third Testament talks a lot about. I'm going to break it down into two types of trine, and I'll call the first a constructive trine. And we see it in an apple. When I say the word apple, you probably immediately see the red round surface. Inside is the flesh and inside that is the seed. And the whole thing is the apple and the outward part is there to give structure to and protect the flesh. And the flesh is there to give nourishment to the growing seed. And in this sense, when the apple falls to the ground, that outer part falls away. Whereas the inner flesh feeds and becomes, you could say, united to the seed to become that sapling, the, the tree. And again, we see it in the seed itself, where as an outer shell that must fall apart, the endosperm, which is there to nourish the embryo, what's called the embryo, which is where the actual DNA of the tree exists. And it, so there's this union of the two inner parts as the third part falls away. And we see that uh, in this story, and we will we will look at that. That's we could say a constructive type of uh, trine, and it goes from outward to inward, from.
from lower to higher. And I call it constructive because it's a building up of the materials needed for something to happen. And then there's a process triumph. And we see that also in the apple tree. The Lord's purpose, I will say, in an apple tree is to give delight to human beings and animals. And uh, to do that, there needs to be a process, a means. The means is the tree. So we have the Lord's purpose. The means is design, is wisdom in the form of a tree. And then the product of that tree, including the fruit, which is the eating of it and the delight we feel. And you see how these two types of trine interact and are both needed for the end product, which is that the Lord give us his delight. The one supports the other. As soon as we open to chapter two, we see the indication that this story is going to be about these trines on the third day. And because it's time that's being spoken of, we can know that this is a, a process that we're first introduced, a process trying. And we further know that that must be true by the next phrase, which is that there is a wedding in Cana of Galilee. A wedding, of course, always means the Lord's uniting to us his desire to wed his will and his love and his truth to our lives. And so this is the process that is ripe to occur. The Lord has brought our mind, our spirit through the necessary stages of a process and we are ready for him to unite himself to us that we might actually live like that seed growing up. And that brings us to another theme here, which is represented by the number two. So we have a three and we have a two, and these will keep appearing throughout the story. The next phrase has to do with who's invited to this wedding. And again, it's a three. And it starts out with the mother of Jesus, Jesus, and the disciples of Jesus. And the order in which these are stated, I believe, is important, and that will come out uh, later on. But we can know that these three elements are representing, these three guests are representing the construction or the constructive materials needed for the wedding to take place. And we can, of course, know that the Lord is the highest representing celestial love in our highest level of mind. The disciples are all the truths of faith and the spiritual level of mind. And the mother of Jesus is representing the natural, the natural level of our mind and all the things there that support the higher levels. There's a problem at this wedding, though, which is that the wine has run out. And which means that the, the union of the Lord to our mind has not yet reached fullness. Something still needs to occur. Now, Mary is worried about this. She's worried about it and she brings it to the Lord. And she says, they have run out of wine. And the Lord says something which comes across as pretty cold. He says, basically, you think I care about that woman? And that's what it sounds like, doesn't it? But I'm sure because it's coming from the Lord's mouth, who is divine love, when he said the word woman, he said it in a way that she knew she was loved. And yet she also came to understand in that moment, I believe, at least a step in the direction of realizing this is no longer mine. I don't have authority over this man. And I can't take credit for this man. And remember, she came first in the list, just like when we think of the apple, we first think of that outer shell. 
And that's actually the root of the reason the wine runs dry is because that's not actually the order. In our lives, we can't help but coming from a sense of self. Everything we do arises from our sense of self. Everything we think is tied to our sense of self. When we love, it feels like me loving. And that's that outer core that comes first. And because that's the sensation, we can't help but falling into this mistake that we are the source or the mother of what is actually divine coming down from below. We mistake ourselves to be the mother of the Lord when actually we are a home, a vessel into which the Lord can find his, his dwelling place. We are that apple skin keeping the inside safe. And so in that moment, the Lord has realigned his relationship with ourselves, or he has realigned our mind in how we understand our relationship with the Lord. And immediately after this, the Lord, or Mary says, whatever this man says, do that, obey. And so we see that this represents the laying down of everything we have rather than as an authority, but in obedience to. We are making ourselves servants to. And this is the lowest level of our mind. I am not the owner of this life. I am the servant to this life. And in the natural sense, it sounds weird. One moment he's saying, I don't care about this problem. And then the very next sentence, he's solving the problem. But in a spiritual sense, it really makes perfect sense. He's realigned the way we understand and feel our relationship with the Lord. And from that realignment now, he can deliver what he's always wanted to deliver to us, which is the, the wine, which is the highest form of spiritual truth, a form that brings us great delight and makes us feel love, just like wine brings people happiness and brings uh, you know, it's called the social lubricant. It makes people feel warm towards one another and want to be with one another and talk with one another. But until we have our, a true understanding of who we are, what our program is in relation to the Lord, we can't have that for very long because if we did, that same sense of self and belief in the self would take credit for that and the situation would be worse than the first not only would we be taking credit for uh what we've already felt but when we start to have this influx of incredible wonder and awe at the the lord's love and the magnificent truth about that love and from that love well then we're really in trouble and we heard in our first reading about priests and prophets being drunk and vomiting and all kinds of trouble. Well, I think that's what it's talking about because the very next thing it talks about is things have to be introduced line by line, precept by precept. And you plow for a while, but then you plant and finally you harvest. There's an order that things must occur. And that's what our arcana number also said said, first, we must feel that we are the one doing things. We have to apply ourselves to fight evil and falsity. And that is right. That is good. That skin has to be there. But as the marriage begins to occur, the, the endosperm and the embryo inside the apple, then that outer layer falls down and we see the truth. And that's the wedding of the Lord to our life our sense of self, and then we see the truth that the whole process from beginning to end, and if you remember what the 
Arcana passage said, it said, every decision, every ambition to be good, every iota of faith, every single thing of the entire process of repentance and regeneration has only ever been done by the Lord. If we let that sink in, that has a radically powerful effect on our entire view of what reality is, of who we are. Think about the implications of that statement. It means that the Lord, as he says, as we read in here, is the all in all, the almighty, the first and the last, the root and the offshoot. He is everything. He is the doer and the doing. He is the thinking and the thinking, the loving and the love. We don't love. We're a house for love to love. We don't think good thoughts. We're a home for good thoughts to think. We don't do. The Lord does. What does that mean? That means that we are all, and we always have been, but haven't been able to feel it, in a divine marriage with God, with the Lord. He has always been the all in all of everything we've ever done. That's unity. And if that's true for us, that is true for everyone. Which means we are one, not just with the divine, we are one with one another. And when we start to see this, then we, all the things we read in the third testament, especially in divine providence and divine love and wisdom where these ideas are condensed. The Lord is in the minutest detail of every event that ever occurs and in every state and every development of state. Instead of just being a nice idea, we start to feel it. We start to feel the magnitude and awe of that truth and that the Lord is in all things without being contained by anything. That he is omnipresent and omniscient and all powerful. And that the whole of reality is a continually opening expression or revelation of God's divine love. And from that state, if you remember our, our apocalypse revealed quote, talked about how this wine is seen through eyes of love. It's seen when our eyes are in a state of love. And that's, of course, the Lord too. But when we have those eyes of love and we read the word, it's not the same. We are seeing new ideas that we've read a hundred times, but it's just pouring out the Lord made about 360 gallons of wine. <laughs> and that's what sometimes can happen. We start to read and it just overwhelms us. It just is too much. We can't necessarily keep a sermon to four pages, for example. <laughs> it just, yeah, turn off the faucet. So again, we get to the numbers two and three when we look at the fact that there are six pots, these six pots or jars, and each of them contain two or three what metetre, metrete, and if I was reading, I'd get it right, but it's too long to read. Um, and that is also equivalent to about 20 or 30 gallons, no coincidence. So again, it's two and three, and six is two and three. So the three is united with the two to become this one magnificent reality. And we think of the six days of creation, what follows right after that? The Sabbath, which is our union with the Lord, which is the day of rest. Because when we are in this state where we're actually feeling or experiencing or seeing these truths, we have complete rest. What is there to fear? What is there to rush about, to feel desperate about, 
What is there to be angry about? All of those negative feelings are unable to exist in that state of mind where we're seeing all those truths of the Lord, where we're feeling them. That's the why. Now, we start with the stone, right? When we start to read the word, it's stony. It's harsh. And when we really have started, when the very beginning, we're using those stones, the Ten Commandments, to hurl at other people. Oh, you're wrong. You're doing the wrong thing. And we read that faith in the Lord is the cornerstone it's that the Lord will build his church upon. We use that to stone other people too. Hey, your faith is wrong. Well, that's the beginning. And that's where we start. That's just the way it is. And eventually we start to turn those stones against ourselves. We realize this isn't really what the Lord is wanting me to do. It's pretty clear. It wants me to try to love others and to clean up my own act. And now we're getting to the waters of baptism. The stones have been put in place in our mind. The Ten Commandments are important. Faith in the Lord, faith in the word is important. I need to get the knowledges. And those are the stones in the natural mind. They are the containing vessel. And then when we start to apply them to rinse ourselves with the baptizing waters, we notice a new kind of truth. And that's in the higher level of our mind. We realize truth is fluid. It always goes to the lowest places, right? It's humble. It cleans. It's there to serve and to bless and to quench and to give what life to. And that's what happens when we start to apply the word to ourselves in repentance. And again, that's the next level up. But we're not quite there yet because we have been thinking that we are the ones doing the work. It feels like we are the ones going to the well and drawing out enough water to feel, feed all of Jacob's camels. It's a lot of work. It's heavy work. And we have to go through that stage to line upon line upon line, precept upon precept upon precept. But finally, if we continue in that endeavor by the Lord's mercy, by the Lord's power, as if through us or as if by us. And finally, we realize I'm supposed to bring this water to the master. I'm supposed to bring the water to the master. And so we do. We say, Lord, your word says that you have been the one doing the everything of my life, the everything good of my life. And the only reason we can swallow that, the only reason we are willing to buy into that, to believe it, is because we have been doing all this work in devotion to trying to live according to the Lord's will. So we're in the practice of trying to obey the word, and we've felt the good results too. We've seen how that water has brought life to the desert so we do we say okay the lord says everything is his all good things is his the universe is his it's an expression of his love and we start trying to believe that and trying to see it and then this miracle occurs suddenly we feel it and we see it and it blows us away it is awesome and it is of a completely different nature than the truth we had been reading all these years. It's everywhere. There's nothing that isn't the Lord's truth. There's nothing that isn't the Lord's present with us. Now, we cannot stay there forever. It's important to drink more water than we drink wine, or we are going to be in trouble. We will find ourselves in rooms saying, my name is Kent and I'm an alcoholic. <clears throat> Which isn't a bad thing. That's still part of the water. <laughs> but what this means is that the Lord will never remove the purpose of either the skin of the apple or the endosperm of the apple or the seed. 
those need to stay in place. We need to have a sense of self that contains the joy. That's what the Lord wants. He wants us to have peace and joy. And it's always there. It's always there. But if there's nobody to receive it, then it's pointless, right? So we have to retain our sense of self, which as the reading said, he develops within us by having us do a lot of legwork. And we need to continue to go to the word and drink of it, its waters of living life and to apply it to our lives, to drink and have life flourish within us and to cleanse ourselves and to keep washing our feet. As the Lord says, you're never gonna be done needing to wash the feet even after you've been baptized. So we must always continue in the work that comes with having an as of self. And it's a beautiful work. And once we've tasted the wine, it becomes even more beautiful because we know the truth. We know this is the as of self. And I get to do this work because it's fun, because it's enjoyable. I get to be a wonderful position of serving the Lord, not just serving the Lord in his purposes in my life, but to be a conduit of this wine and this, all these good things for other people by loving them. In loving a person, we actually are revealing the truth about the Lord and also speaking truth to them because truth is needed for us to experience the Lord's joy, his love, and his peace. So it's truly an amazing story. And we can't seek the wine directly, like Mary said, hey, we need some wine. Problem with that is that when we want that wine, and that's why we're searching for it, and that's why we're in the word, we're really just trying to get happy. Right? I want to follow the Lord so I can be happy, which is an intermediate state. It's important for a while, but it's not going to get us to the wine. Again, if we get to the wine from that state, it will not be good for us. So we, so, but having had a little taste, there was a little wine at first, but it ran out. Having that little taste helps us to say, okay, I'm just going to submit myself to the Lord. I know it's good, even if I don't always feel it. So precept upon precept, line upon line. It's truly amazing. So in the end, the Lord uses even that natural, which has to be schleft away or it has to fall away. At the end of the gospel, when he's on the cross, the Lord says something similar. He addresses Mary. He says, to quote, when Jesus sees his mother and the disciple whom he loves standing nearby, he says to his mother, woman, here is your son. And he says to the disciple, here is your mother. So from that hour, this disciple took her into his own. He doesn't just let that apple skin be worthless. It too, eventually, as the tree becomes a real tree in size, that uh, skin has turned into soil and it becomes absorbed into the tree and rejoins with the life of the tree. Our sense of self by the holiness of the Lord is brought into meaning and purpose, serving that holiness. Just like the stone pot, you don't throw it away once you've tasted the wine, the wine will spill everywhere and it's worthless. Everything in the economy of the Lord is brought into his sacredness and the purposes of his love. It's, a, it's amazing. <laughs> so that the first is the last and the last is the first in the best possible way. A single apple, a single reality, which is the Lord. And we get to participate of and enjoy and celebrate together at his wedding feast. Amen.
And now to the one only God, Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord, be with us continually and lift up and turn thy face towards us. Teach, enlighten, and lead us, since out of self we can do nothing of good. And give us that we may live, that the devil may not seduce us and put evils into our hearts, knowing that while we are not led by thee, O Lord, he leads and breathes in evils of every kind, such as hatreds, revenges, cunnings, deceits, as a serpent breathes in poisons, for he is present, excites, and continually accuses. And whenever he encounters the heart turned away from thee, O God, he enters, dwells there, and draws the soul toward hell. Free us, Lord. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. Amen. Um.